Hello Internet, Seth Skorkowski, and today we'll be taking a look at the Call of Cthulhu adventure Panacea. Written by Sandy Peterson and Mike Mason, the scenario appears in 2017's Peterson's Abominations, which is a collection of five modern-era one-shot adventures based off of scenarios that Peterson would run while doing the convention circuit. Because all of these originated as one-shot adventures, they're all short enough to be played in a single session, they all come with their own pre-generated characters, and they are all extremely deadly. Panacea explores a small pharmaceutical company that's got a new and amazing wonder drug coming out, and the heroes uncovering a sinister plot involving the mythos. Coming in at 36 pages, the adventure is broken into three acts, which can be really helpful for timing out the adventure as you're playing it, provides us with six pre-generated characters, each with their own motivation for investigating this mystery. The adventure took us about 10 hours in order to complete it spread across two sessions. I don't really guesstimating that amount because this was our first in-person game that we got to have in about a year and a half, so uh, really it was actually 16 hours that we were together and supposed to be playing, but I'm going to easily say that about six of that was just us chatting and BSing and getting to catch up with each other, so we'll say it was about 10 hours of actual playtime in order to complete it. My players also really got into the roleplay of this adventure, as well as sped off into half a dozen different directions that this adventure or probably no other adventure could have possibly anticipated for. Uh, so in short, I really had to improvise my butt off for this one. The module also has what I consider to be a major flaw, which I didn't notice until we were well into playing it, and then there was a mad scramble on my part in order to fill that in in order to keep the adventure running smoothly. But we did manage to pull it off, we had a lot of laughs and a lot of fun. So what I'm going to do is offer my tips, my criticisms, as well as a few suggestions as a game master who has successfully run this scenario. And I'm Jack the NPC. I'm here to give it to you from a player's side of things as we start this adventure off at a party and very nearly ended it at a total party kill. But before we go any further, I must warn you that there will be spoilers. So any players in the audience, if you ever want to play this adventure, please stop here. But send your Game Master this way to see if Panacea is right for you. But if you keep going and you spoil yourself, the side effects will be incurable. Okay, Keepers, let's get this thing started. The setup for the adventure is that a new pharmaceutical company, Zymed Bio, is about to release their new wonder drug, Xylactis. They're currently in Phase 2 testing, which is human subjects, and they're sending false reports off to the FDA. Now, the truth is that Zymed Bio is really a cult of Shubnigarath, and the Xylactis drug that they're trying to sell is really just the processed milk from this elder god. Now, the scenario spends a lot of time talking about the Anik brothers, Brothers who founded the company. Uh, they're part Chocho, and they're billionaires, and they're just evil cultists. However, they're going to be out of town during the course of this adventure and don't appear in it at all. They're simply shadowy, powerful figures that are going to be in the background, and they would serve as great villains if you wanted to work them into a longer campaign. But because my group became so fixated on them to the point that it really became a distraction from the adventure itself, I suggest that if you are going to run this adventure as a one-shot game, uh, either have the Anik brothers be present during the course of the adventure, that way the uh, player characters get to confront them and see them, or just simply remove them entirely from the adventure, uh, changing the company owners to being the employees that do appear in the adventure. The cult has also summoned a Dark Young, who's now biomechanically fused into the building's computer system. This Dark Young can summon part of its mother goddess so the company can gather her milk. The scenario gives us six pre-generated characters, each with their own reason to invest investigate Zymed Bio. Some know one another while others don't. One is a former employee who was fired after she refused to submit herself for the drug's trials. Another is a cop who was investigating an animal attack that happened in the parking lot. He and his partner were split up and taken off the case after Xylactis cured their police chief's cancer. One is a reporter who was investigating the company, but after his editor was accepted into the Xylactis clinical trials, he declared his HIV cured and then forbade the player character from looking into this company any further. 
Now, Wade is a private investigator who is hired by Zymed Bio to look into the character that was recently fired. He's getting an uneasy feeling about the company and was essentially told to kidnap her and bring her in, which he refused to do. But he does intend on talking to her and seeing if she'll go with him if he agrees to protect her. Now, that part of his motivation I removed. And the reason is because I know my players, and something like that would only encourage them just to go straight to Zymed Bio is the first thing they're going to do. They're not going to research anything. Thing, it's really going to discourage all the PCs from even teaming up together. Oh, definitely on that. After the game was done, Seth shared with us that part of Wade's backstory that he had deleted when he passed out that character. And we looked at it, and we were all, yeah, you did a pretty good call by deleting that. Because had he left that in there, our group wouldn't have even teamed up together in the first place. Also, Marina has some information about the building that's going to be helpful in Act 3. So if none of the players decide to play her and she's not going to be an active NPC in your game, then you're going to need to provide that information another way, because none of my players in our game decided to play her, so she was really just an NPC that was used in Act 1 and a little bit in Act 2, but she really wasn't an active member throughout the entire adventure. The scenario is set in a city. Now, which city that is, is determined by the Keeper. It says that Sandy set the adventure in the Dallas, Texas area, and because my group and I all live in the DFW area, I sent, went ahead and set it there too, a uh, Plano to be exact. I then photoshopped some Google Maps to show it and gave those out as handouts to my players. So if you want to use those, I stuck a link to where you can get them below, as well as my pre-filled character sheets for the pre-gens, because I prefer using full character sheets over the condensed version that the module provides. Just remember that each character has 40 unallotted skill points that the player can assign wherever it is they like. The adventure begins at the party of Chuck Ogle. He's a pretty well-to-do man with severe diabetes that's recently caused the loss of his legs. Most of his guests believe that this bash is really just Chuck's way of saying goodbye to everybody. Some of the player characters are invited, others are going to be crashing this party. There's going to be booze and drugs everywhere. Now one thing that I added was a large backyard with a hot tub where several guests were getting to enjoy that. Oh, it is that kind of party then. Okay. Okay, I can roll with that, no big deal. Hey, give me a refill on that, and I'm talking about some of the good stuff. We're gonna say goodbye to Chuck in style. The PCs that are familiar with one another should hopefully interact while they're at this party. Uh, maybe one is going to notice Wade following Marina around. Now eventually their host is going to wheel himself out of his room, making a late appearance to his own party. Now one of his hands is going to be covered and wrapped in a bandage, and he's got his amputated legs hidden beneath a blanket. After a short speech, he declares that this miracle drug from Zymed Bio has cured his diabetes and regrown his legs. Oh wow, this is amazing, Chuck. Good for you. This drug is going to change the world. What was the name of that company again? Because I think I might want to be making some investments. And with that, he whips off the blanket to show his newly grown legs, which are a hairy and end with cloven hooves, and they resemble goat legs more than human legs. Um, okay then. I uh, guess that does beat the alternative, but damn, Chucky. You could have warned me about those first. After this, Chuck returns to his chair and plays host to everybody as everybody gets themselves thoroughly polluted on booze and drugs and everything else. Chuck's going to ignore most of the male guests, focusing solely on the women guests. He might solicit one of the women PCs, you know, trying to uh, take them back to his bedroom. Now, if one of those player characters take him up on it, uh, he's going to lure an NPC back to the bedroom with them. Now, she's going to resist, but most of the guests are going to be you know, too high or too blitz to even notice or care. For my game, since nobody was playing Marina, I used her because Wade was there following her, and he was going to sure to notice this. Keepers might want to have a friendly NPC, like a friend or maybe somebody that they meet at this party that can serve as Chuck's victim, who all the player characters, or at least most of the player characters, will know. Surely, after they disappear into his room, the investigators are going to hear a scream. If they smash open the door, they'll find Chuck standing, the bandages gone, and his grotesque body on full display. He's then going to lash out at any intruders with a giant frog-like tongue. Whoa, holy crap! Could you put some pants on before I kick your ass, Chucky? I did not need to see your goat peen there. Chuck, who's becoming more animal than human, is going to fight for a brief time, and if not taken down, is going to smash through one of the windows and escape. 
The module says that the rest of the guests are going to be too inebriated to really notice all this going on, but I changed that, so in my game, the guests notice all this. Oh yeah, that party went crazy. Some people went in full-blown, paranoid screamer mode because they thought the world was coming to an end or something. Other people just thought it was a joke and they were laughing and talking like they didn't even notice nothing was going on. One dude in the backyard hot tub, he screams out, Way to go, Chuck! as he sees Goat Boy smash through the back window, sprint across the yard, and hop over a 12-foot fence like it was nothing. Anyway, we knew we didn't have much time in order to search this place and get any evidence and get the hell out of here before the cops were certainly going to get called and shut that party down. Searching the house, they're going to find Chuck's acceptance package for the Xylactus testing. And with that, the first act of the adventure is done. Act 2 is gathering information. The module gives us several possibilities. Uh, the player characters can try joining one of the testing groups, you know, maybe have some of this drug tested out on them. Uh, they can interview former test patients to see what's going on and see if they've had any sort of uh, strange effects themselves. They can even try hacking into the computer system for this company. Now, my group did all of that and then some. Now with the hacking, because there is a Dark Young that's wired into the computer network, there is a chance of him being able to attack them through the internet, even using spells through the internet in order to get at them. Now one of my player characters who tried this, uh, he got a vision of something you know, dark and sinister beneath the Zymed bio building. I was trying to use that as some sort of hint that maybe they should go in and go down there and check that out. Gus reached out to his former police partner, who the module never ever names, so keepers, you should go ahead and give that character a name, and he asked him to help with hacking this building. So after a couple days of not hearing back from his former partner, uh, he went down to the house to discover his partner dead, his heart having exploded out of his chest and kind of slammed into the computer monitor. But they were able to find enough information that his partner had been able to retrieve and print out that was sitting in the computer tray, so they were able to get some little bit of information after they dealt with the sanity loss from his partner being killed in such a horrible way, which the coroner just kind of deemed as a really extreme heart attack. The next night, Gus awoke to find his police chief sitting on the edge of his bed holding a pistol. The chief, who is now transforming into some sort of dog thing, said how he had ordered Gus to stop looking into Zymed Bio and now things had escalated out of his control. They managed to kill their mutated chief and then robbed his house, discovering a gun safe which had plenty of firearms in it, and then they discovered a little bit more information about Zymed Bio. Then they played a late night visit to the news editor, discovering that he was now transforming into some sort of owl thing, and he was out all night eating rodents throughout his neighborhood. They did search his place as well, but they still didn't know what to do. Now, the problem with Act 2 in this adventure is that nothing actually pushes the player characters into going into Act 3. Now, my players aren't the kind who aren't going to act until they know that something is really their best choice, that they've gone through all their options and they've really determined uh, that this is the best course of action for them to take, and they are going to stall that until the world ends, until something tells them to go ahead and move forward. Out of character, we all knew exactly what we should be doing next. We even told that to Seth. Hey, I bet the next thing our characters should do would be breaking into those laboratories, am I right? But until our characters had a good affirmation that that is what the next course of action should be for them, we weren't going to make any move at all. Hell, even once we did get an affirmation of what our next move should be, we might stick around and wait and keep looking just to get a second opinion or some sort of confirmation that that really was the next thing we should be doing. All I know is our ability to delay action is infinite. I didn't notice that the adventure doesn't give a solid push to push the player characters into investigating the Zymed bio building in Act 3 until a while after we had really started this adventure, and then I was scrambling trying to uh, give them a good clue in order to give them that push uh, without making it be where it's just obvious that that's what they're supposed to do for the next part of the adventure. You know, give their characters a good reason why this would make sense as a logical action that they should take. So for any keepers out there, here are some suggestions as far as what you can do if you decide to run this adventure. 
First, Wade is among the player characters, so you could have uh, Jim Connady, his employer at Zymed Bio, call him for an update of the status of everything going on. And then he asks Wade to bring Marina in for questioning, essentially that part of his opening backstory, you could go ahead and add that now. Once Wade has met everybody and he's already working with the group and they've already teamed up, this is a good hook and a good call to action in order to push the adventure forward. I just didn't like putting it into the adventure before all of the player characters had met and hooked up and decided to team up with one another, uh, but once they've started teamed up and working together, you can go ahead and introduce that as a very good plot point in order to push the narrative. Next is the Dark Young. Now, this thing is wired directly into the internet, so think of it like the world's greatest hacker. It can track their phones, it can listen in on any conversations that are going on around their phones, or maybe uh, tap in through their Alexa or smart TV or something like that, or it might even try reaching out to them. So maybe it can lure the player characters into entering the Zymed Bio building uh, by sending them a text or even just calling them on the phone. Uh, it can threaten them, or it might just be more upfront with like, hey guys, we need to talk, and then refusing to divulge exactly who or what it is. It's just a strange voice on the phone saying that might be in their interest to come into the Zymed Bio building, and it can ensure that some of the doors will be open for them. Maybe Jim Connady can kidnap one of the NPCs in order to lure the characters in. Uh, several of the player characters have friends and family that are listed on their character sheets, and with a Dark Young's access to the internet, it wouldn't be hard for them to find out who those NPCs are and be able to use those NPCs against the player characters. Maybe it doesn't even need to kidnap or harm any of these NPCs, because it can make the player characters believe that it has or believe that it can. Remember that this cyber dark young has total control of their phones and their computers. It's going to be able to block all calls, it could fabricate new videos that it wants. Uh, so in a modern era game, having an enemy that has basically total control of electronics and the internet makes it extremely scary and extremely formidable. However you want to do it is fine. If nothing else, keepers can always call for an idea role in order to keep the game moving forward and keep it from stalling out and people getting bored because they don't know what to do, uh, but keepers should also think about all of this in advance because uh, the module never really gives a reason to push the player characters into Act 3, and a little bit of a narrative push can go a long way, so go ahead and give that some thought beforehand. Uh, that way, depending on how the game goes, you can go ahead and drop in the appropriate push in order to keep the adventure going. Now, Act 3 is exploring the Zymed Bio building itself. The module says that the optional time to do this is at night, and it's written assuming that it's going to be done at night. But again, nothing really sends the player characters here, and nothing sends them there at night. So again, I suggest having the PCs be invited or coerced into coming at night. Uh, Marina, being a former employee, knows the general layout and that the key for accessing the East Wing is in Jim Connady's office. And that is fine if Marina's in the party, because she could just pass that information along to them. But if Marina is not one of the player characters that you got in your group, then what I suggest that you do is you just stick a map of the building up in the lobby somewhere, and the player character's gonna get a picture of it with their phone, or you can have a few printouts of it that were available behind the reception desk, and the player characters can grab one of those, and now everybody's got a map to the building that they can use. As far as getting a key to get over to the laboratory side of the building, you could stick a key or a passcode anywhere you want on the west side of the building. There's probably multiple ones over there. So the player characters, they still gotta go over to the office side of the building, search around, hopefully find one, maybe even find a couple of them, and then they can head on over to the laboratory side of the building where the rest of the adventure awaits. Now one thing with this map, the rooms are all numbered with a key saying which room goes with which number. Problem is, the room descriptions in the book don't include the room numbers that appear on the map. So if the players want to go to, let's say, room 47, then they have to reference the key to see that room 47 is Jefferson Annex office, and then you check the book to see the description for Jefferson Annex office. So before you run this adventure, just jot the room numbers next to the description for each room inside the module, save yourself a bit of time and a bit of headache on this. Meanwhile, the cultist employees have all been taking this drug on the sly, you know, sneaking a dose every now and then, and they've all begun mutating out of control, and it's all of a sudden that they've started doing this. Uh, many of them losing their humanity and gone completely insane, while others are completely unaware that anything's going on with them. They're just acting business as normal, even though they've turned into these just horrific monsters. This can lead to several combats, some interesting interactions, or just tense moments 
elements of the PCs trying to sneak past them in order to get a key to get to the lab side. The player character should also begin uncovering hints as to how what's really going on here and why all this is happening. Meanwhile, this Dark Young that's in charge of the computer building network, it locks all the shutters and the exit doors, trapping everybody inside. Then, using the building's intercoms, it's going to talk to the player characters, uh, trying to seduce them into embracing this drug, uh, even using personal aspects about the player characters' backstories, uh, such as a dying relative, as a means to get them to submit to this new world that it's promising them is going to be achievable once this drug is out on the market. Disease, age, suffering shall be but memory. Jack, if you join us, you will never need to hide your pain with alcohol again. Yeah, sorry Alexa. You almost had me going there for a bit, but you lost me with that last pot. I love this aspect about it, and keepers who are not going to be using the pre-generated characters for this adventure should go over the characters that are going to be used for this adventure and see if there are any friends or family or any NPCs that are in the backstory that this Dark Young could use as ammunition against the player characters in order to try to uh, seduce them into joining this cult and you know, be able to say stuff like how no one's ever going to need to suffer the way they did if they passed away, or be able to save their lives if something you know might be a disease or just old age or something is threatening this person that the player characters care about, this Dark Young is going to try to give them a way to save them from that. Eventually, the PCs are going to make it to the laboratory wing. We're going to find some animals from the Phase 1 testing who've mutated with human-like characteristics, including hands and the ability to speak. They'll find the milking room where one of Shub Niggurath's monstrous udders gets summoned in and suckled by captive creatures who then spit this milk into a trough for collection. This is such a magnificently grotesque picture, I absolutely love it. Now, somewhere in here, the PC should run into Jim Connody, who's now mutated into his satyr form because of his own use of this drug. Now, he's still in control of his own humanity for a while, and he can explain the backstory and the plot to the player characters and how things have not gone the way that the cult has planned, and giving the PCs, and therefore the players, kind of the full picture as to what's going on here. What I don't understand is if Jim's special key was the only way we could get over to the laboratory side of the building, and that's why we had to go find Jim's office in order to get his special pass card in order to get over to the laboratories, then how in the hell is Jim already over in the laboratories because it's been pretty well established he ain't got his keys on him. Um, okay, so maybe we could say that there was a thumbprint scanner that was on the door, and his thumbprints are actually still the same in his mutated form, or maybe we could say that those were just his spare keys that were found in the office, and he has another set of keys that's on his person. I, I don't know, but it doesn't really make sense that he'd be here if he didn't have his keys. Now, one of the reasons that I do suggest that keepers could put keys in any of the senior staff office when they go over to the office side of the building, instead of them just being found in Jim's office only, is because clearly the other staff has been going over to the other wing of the building and getting the pieces of this drug and injecting themselves with it, so clearly there are more keys around here, so they don't just have to be only available in Jim's office, and that helps it make a little bit more sense as to why Jim is even here if the PC is the ones that have his key. Now, in the basement server room for the building, the PCs are going to encounter the Dark Young that's wired into the computers in some sort of Cronenberg fusion. Now, I say that you just go ahead and run with this idea. Don't just describe how its tentacles are kind of plugged into bundles of wire or something like that, uh, but go ahead and fuse this monster with the machinery, you know, giving it you know, LEDs that might be going down parts of its body, as well as hardware that might be sticking out of it. Just go nuts with it, you know, give it a USB port right next to one of its mini eyeballs. Uh, maybe instead of saying that it's got the four tentacles that it can normally attack with, uh, so much of it is actually bound up into this, uh, these terminals that it's only got you know two or three tentacles that it can uh, actually attack with because it's kind of stuck and harnessed to all this machinery. This thing is bad news. Not only has it got spells and all the other abilities that make fighting a Dark Young pretty difficult to do, but by the time we even made it down there, our sanity had been chipped away so low that just the a side of it drove three out of our four characters temporarily insane. And that one character that wasn't driven insane by it, yeah, he got himself shot by one of the other insane player characters who got paranoid thinking that that dude was setting him up to get eaten by this monster. This creature nearly caused a total party kill, and all it had done was just stepped out of the shadows and said hello. 
Another thing that I really just love about this monster is that it's treated like it's an intelligent creature. It's going to try talking to them and trying to seduce them into joining it instead of just outright attacking them. Defeating the Dark Young in a head-to-head -head fight, that's going to be near impossible for them to do. These things are seriously tough. But if the player characters instead attack the servers and destroy those, since those are the big reason why it's here and it's not going to be able to do this big plot without being hooked up to the servers, so now they've destroyed its whole reason for being here, it might just gate out of here and flee without the player characters having to really attack this thing directly itself. Keepers might want to use an insane insight or something like that in order to help the players out with that idea, uh, maybe encourage them that there is a strategy that they can do, even though it's kind of crazy to try it. But I'd also go ahead and come up with some sort of armor and hit point value for the servers. Uh, that way you've got something that you can measure it by as the player characters begin attacking these things with fire axes or guns or just kicking them a lot or whatever it is they decide to do. Once the creature is destroyed or gates home, the adventure is done. Uh, the player characters can then open up the security shutters for the building and escape, though most likely, knowing Call of Cthulhu investigators, they're probably going to want to set it on fire first. Yeah, that is kind of a signature move there. But if you want to make it a little bit more difficult for your players to burn this place down, make sure that they tell you that they're turning off the building's fire suppression system first, Otherwise, they might find it a little difficult to keep that place burning. Overall, I'm pretty torn on this scenario. I love the setup of Act 1. I like the premise of it. I like the conspiracy aspect of the adventure as this company has ensured loyalty of both the police and the press by getting these people cured of whatever diseases they have. I love the Dark Young being wired to the building and to the internet and how this creature behaves. I think it's great. I think it's a wonderful change of pace to how these monsters are uh, normally portrayed as being more animalistic or not really uh, being able to have some sort of speed speaking role, even in this case it does directly have a speaking role. However, the adventure still makes several assumptions as to what the characters will do in certain situations, instead of giving the characters a reason to do those actions. The player characters don't all know each other once the adventure begins. Part of Act 1 is the PCs getting to meet one another for the first time, or learning to overcome their differences because they might not like each other, and deciding to team up. So, for some groups, the players, if they're going to be really role-playing this, might initially resist teaming up together in the first place. There is no call to action for Act 3, meaning that nothing actually sends them to the building. And not having any sort of ticking time clock aspect to the adventure means that the players are going to take as much time as they need in order to do this, so uh, you might want to have some sort of uh, ticking time clock, some sort of time limit as to why they need to act before a certain time before something bad happens. Uh, otherwise, the game might stall and you know lose all of its steam altogether, leaving everybody pretty dissatisfied with it. As a convention game, where the players come in knowing that they only have four hours in order to complete this entire adventure before the game is just going to be over with, players are going to be more inclined just to go ahead and charge straight into the laboratory, they're not going to waste as much time really thinking about it and pondering their moves because they know they've only got a few hours in order to do this. But in a regular group game that you're playing for your friends, if you're going to be able to split this across multiple sessions, the PCs might need a little bit more incentive in order to act on that. So keepers, definitely consider beforehand adding a call to action to the scenario, uh, such as a threat to the character's loved ones or an actual call from the bad guys. Uh, maybe there's a friendly NPC that's working on the inside that maybe calls and informs them a good time to break in would be on this night, and the PCs can get some good incriminating information in order to bring this company down. Whatever it is that works for your group, go ahead and give that some thought before the adventure begins. Uh, that way you might not run the risk of having this thing stall out on you. And definitely keep in mind the lethality of this game. This thing is most likely going to end with the PCs, one or most of them, if not all of them, getting killed once they meet the final bad guy. Or, if they're driven insane by meeting the bad guy, they might submit to the Dark Young's offers and end up joining the cult, because they've gone insane and everything that it says suddenly really makes sense to them. Uh, so it kind of ends with them becoming the new villains for the, you know, the, the, the next generation of PCs to face. And I think that's a really cool ending, where it might, you know, be them going through, they're taking out all these cultists, they think they're about to win, and then it ends with them actually becoming the bad guys themselves. Uh, but many players might 
might not consider that a nice and rewarding ending, so definitely consider that of who it is you're going to be running this through before you decide to run your group through it. For my group, once the two surviving player characters had left the building, much of their strength permanently reduced after their fight against this dark young, I added a small mention of the test animals, the laboratory animals that were in the building, because those had escaped, because the PCs had let them out of their cages, and since these things have human hands, they were able to open doors, and once the building unlocked, they were able to get outside. So as their car's headlights were cutting across the parking lot, uh, they caught the glow of animal eyes kind of sitting right outside in the darkness, these kind of malformed shapes that then turned and loped away into the darkness and towards the city itself. And I thought it was a nice little add-on to kind of end this adventure on that things really weren't always going to be back to normal. You can pick up Peterson's Abominations on the Chaosium website and on DriveThruRPG. Links below. It's got a few flaws, but with some preparation, it can be a pretty exciting adventure. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews or how to's, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, gamers, you have a great day. You know, one thing that I think would be pretty cool to do is if you were going to be using this adventure as part of a longer running campaign, the Keeper should one or two adventures before this one find out what each character's favorite animal is, or what animal each character most closely identifies with. And then, once they do this adventure, if they get themselves injected with this drug and start discovering that they're mutating into an animal, have it be that that's also what their favorite animal is. Or, if they have some sort of phobia about a particular animal, you know, something that really freaks them out, now they have the added horror of realizing that that is the creature that they're becoming. That might require a little bit more sanity loss in their part. I think that'd be a nice touch.